Hi, I'm Misa, and my project this summer focused on using next generation applicant sequencing to determine the diversity of Vibrio species in the Alawai Canal. Um, first, I'd like to thank Papa Jack for this opportunity because I learned so much this summer and I wouldn't have been able to do this without his generosity. And I would also like to thank my mentors, Prakit and Dr. Yan, for helping me throughout the whole project and teaching me everything. <laughs> so there are 74 known species of bacteria with the genus Vibrio. And the common characteristics among bacteria of this genus are that they're halophobic, facultative, anaerobic, and trash eating. Because of these qualities, the Vibrio thrive in marine and coastal waters, estuaries, and man-made aquaculture settings. And in addition, Vibrio bacteria play a really big role in nutrient recycling because they're able to break down organic molecules in trash and actually recycle them as inorganic molecules, which can be used by other organisms. The Alawai Canal is a small man-made estuary that contains large amounts of sediments, trash, and rocks, and has warm temperatures. And it also creates a salinity gradient from the Manoa stream to the ocean. And because of this, the Alawai serves as the perfect home for enormous populations of Vibrio bacteria. But if the Vibrio are helpful in nutrient recycling, why should we care? It's because some species of Vibrio are actually human pathogens. So there are 10 known human pathogenic species, but of these, the four most prominent are Vibrio cholera, Vibrio phonificus, Vibrio parahemolyticus, and Vibrio alginolyticus. Um, these human pathogenic Vibrio enter through open wounds or ingestion and cause mild to severe gastroenteritis, wound infections, septicemia, and even death. Every year, there are about 170 million infections in the world, 80,000 illnesses in the United States, and in 2017, there were 55 cases reported in Hawaii. Many of these resulted in deaths. So as you can see, Vibrio are kind of a big problem in the health community. Um, and because these bacteria are so problematic, there have been many studies done to determine the effects of different measures on Vibrio populations. So for example, we know that with salinity, there's a peak around 12 parts per thousand for Vibrio vulnificus, and also for Vibrio vulnificus with temperature, um, they're not able to grow at all at low temperatures. Um, however, these studies use traditional plating and qPCR methods and these methods are great for in-depth research about a particular species, but because qPCR and plating only allows for one species to be analyzed at a time, it's very time consuming for determining the diversity of Vibrio species in different environments, um, which was the question that I wanted to research. So the research question that um, I came up with with my mentor was, can we use next generation applicant sequencing and water quality parameters to better predict where pathogenic Vibrio species are. Um, applicant sequencing is a new technology and it uses primers and DNA polymerase to target certain genes in specific amplification. It's faster for determining diversity because amplifying the DNA in the sample allows variations of the sequence of the same gene, which can be used to determine from which species the DNA came from and the quantity of each species in the sample. And then the six water quality parameters we determined were measurable and would also have an effect on the diversity of Vibrio were temperature, pH, salinity, dissolved oxygen, TSS, or total suspended solids, and BOD or biological oxygen demand. I mean, biochemical oxygen demand. So our first step in this project was to collect the water samples and measure the water quality parameters at the Alawai Canal. Um, to reduce the effect of sunlight on Vibrio growth, we began collecting water samples at 6 a.m. following the path shown. At each location, we measured the temperature, salinity, pH, and dissolved oxygen, and then 
after we had collected all the samples, we returned to the lab to perform the TSS and BOD experiments. So after we had measured all of the water quality parameters, our next step was to extract the DNA from the water samples. Um, to extract the DNA, one liter of each water sample was filtered onto a 0.4 micrometer pore size polycarbonate filter and then stored in negative 20 degrees Celsius. Then later, um, this DNA was extracted using the power soil DNA extraction kit. So once the DNA was extracted, we were ready to amplify it. <laughs> but this was where things didn't really go as planned. So from our research, we determined that the two genes we could use for amplification in determining diversity in Vibrio were the 16S gene and the HSP60 gene. The 16S gene encodes for 16S ribosomal RNA and is common amongst all prokaryotes. It's very commonly used in amplification because of the fact that it's highly conserved between species. So it easily dis differentiates members of different genuses. Um, the HSP60 gene encodes for the heat shock protein and is also common amongst all prokaryotes. However, unlike the 16S, amplification with HSP60 is very experimental. Um, and this is because the HSP60 gene is mostly made of non-conserved regions, which um, makes amplifying it using primers more difficult, but this characteristic of having many non-conserved regions also allows for more specificity in determining differences between species. And because of this reason, although 16S was the safer offer, option, <laughs> we decided to target the HSP60 gene. So our first step was um, trying the primers the Vibrio specific primers targeting the HSP60 gene in PCR amplification with our test water samples. However, we didn't get any amplification even with the positive control. So to determine what the problem was, we then ran the samples using the 16S primers. Since there was amplification from this, we determined that the DNA was correctly extracted and was present in the samples. So the problem was PCR optimization. <laughs> Um, the first thing we decided to target in optimization was the template concentration, and this is because the bands in the initial run were very thick, which showed that the DNA was too concentrated, and it may have been the reason why it didn't ampl amplify using HSP60. So using the isolated strain of Vibrio parahemolyticus, which was the positive control, we found the best concentration of DNA and then retested, retested the HSP60 primer with this concentration, <laughs> but we still didn't get any amplification. <laughs> so after optimizing the template concentration, our next thought was that the positive control of the lab strain of Vibrio parahemolyticus we were using was the problem. So we wanted to see if positive control, control strains of Vibrio isolated from the olivide canal specifically would amplify with the HSP60 primers. We tested these strains using both the primers with adapters and without adapters. And the 16S was again used to verify that there was DNA in the isolated strains. However, <laughs> the HSV60 gene didn't amplify. So we came to the conclusion that the problem was the annealing temperature. Um, annealing is the second step of the PCR process where the primer binds to the, to the DNA strands a high temperature makes it difficult for the primers to bind, but a low temperature results in the primers binding to things that are not the targeted gene, which is actually called non-specific amplification. Therefore, we wanted to find the highest temperature that would still allow the primers to bind. Um, the annealing temperature is usually set with each specific primer, so we only varied the original temperature by a few degrees in attempting to optimize it. We also added magnesium chloride to enhance the function of DNA polymerase, but we still got no results. So at this point, we didn't really know why it wasn't working, so we decided to switch to targeting the 16S gene instead. And this, we tested two pairs of Vibrio-specific 16S primers on the initial Vibrio parahemolyticus positive control. But because the conditions were not optimized, we did not see amplification. Um, 
so with optimized, we optimized the annealing temperature with the primer and we actually got product as you can see in the second picture, but the bands were too thick, which showed that the concentration of the DNA was too high. So we had to optimize the DNA concentration. And then finally we got nice thin bands and it worked. So then we used these PCR conditions to amplify our water samples, including the test sample. Um, the next step was to send the DNA in for sequencing, but because of all the trouble with PCR, we decided to send our test sample in for Sanger sequencing first to determine that the product we had amplified was actually Vibrio bacteria. Um, Sanger sequencing is an old technology that is really fast, but it allows for only one type of amplicone. Although our sample had multiple types of amplicons because the olive water contains many different species of Vibrio, um, Sanger sequencing still works because of the many conserved regions in the 16S DNA. And when the sequencing results were returned, we created a phylogenetic tree with other species of Vibrio. And since our sample was clustered with other species, we, did, we confirmed that it was in fact Vibrio. So next we sent it in for the Illumina sequencing. And this is the sequencing that is the new technology. And it identifies all the amplicons and species in a sample. From these sequencing results, you can determine which species are present and also the quantity of each species in the sample. But because of all the PCR trouble, we only sent our samples in about two weeks ago. So we're still awaiting the results. <laughs> Although we don't have the results from sequencing yet, we do know what the environmental parameters look like across the Alawai Canal. Um, I'm not sure about species distribution, but from this data, I hypothesize that populations of Vibrio will be the highest right before the midpoint of the canal. And this is because of the dip in salinity um, to around 12 parts per thousand, which was shown to be the um, best salinity concentration for the growth of Vibrio in previous studies. And also because of the um, large increase in biological oxygen demand right around this area. Um, this is a little bit concerning because Iolani is right in this area, right before the middle of the Alawai. So I'm really excited <laughs> to see the amount of pathogenic species in the waters near us. Um, we're expecting to get the results soon. So if you really want to know, you can email me <laughs> later. Um, so throughout this project, I learned so much and I'm really, really grateful that I got the opportunity to experience this. Um, the first thing I learned was research skills and such as looking through articles, making phylogenetic trees, downloading gene da databases, and forming the questions necessary for conducting a research project. Another really big thing that I learned was a lot about working in a lab. Um, I especially enjoyed this hands-on aspect of learning how to measure chemicals, micropipettes, sterilized materials, and other things of just how things work in a laboratory. And finally, the biggest thing I learned throughout this project was perseverance. As you could see um, with my project, I really learned that research does not always go the way it's planned, but most of the time it's not supposed to um, because the whole point of research is discovering new things as you go. And although this was really stressful at times because I really wanted things to work out, um, this journey taught me a lot more about problem solving and enjoying the experience of discovering even some things that like don't work. So I would again like to thank Pavu Jack for this opportunity because I learned so much about myself, research, science, and everything. <laughs> and I had such an amazing time doing this project. I would also like to again thank my mentors, Prakit and Dr. Yan for teaching me everything and spending so much time helping me out with this project. They spent a lot of time um, working with me to figure out different things that we could do to get around the different problems we encountered. I'd also like to thank the UH Biomedical Sciences Lab for allowing me to use their resources and the people there for being so kind and helpful. And 
I also want to thank Dr. Chan because she helped me a lot throughout this whole project, especially when I ran into problems. And she also met with me every week to make sure everything was going okay. And I really appreciated that. And finally, I'd like to thank my mom for being really supportive of me this summer and for waking up and walking the five miles down the Alawai to help collect water samples at 6 a.m. that one day. It was really helpful. So, yeah. Thank you.